Once you've seen the truth, you can't keep living the lie. Now, I'm going to share a little secret with you. The truth is, extraordinary results come from repeating ordinary actions over an extraordinary amount of time. This video is one of those results. And the best part is, the skills that have taken me thousands of hours to master, you will learn in just 90 minutes. Now that is an offer you simply can't refuse. Whether you're just starting out with Silas for the very first time, or you're a seasoned one trick like me and want to gain that 1% edge in your Soloiki games, you've come to the right place. This guide covers everything from a very beginner level to actual techniques that I use day to day in my challenger games and catch the opponents off guard. Now when it comes to runes, Silas is a one of a kind champion because he has so many different viable options and it's up to you to correctly identify in champ select what is the perfect setup for my game. And if you can actually do that, you get a huge edge before you even load onto Summoner's Rift. So uh, let's look at all the different rune pages you can have. We're not gonna talk about what's good and when. Let's just look at all the options you have. You either go Conqueror, Presence of Mind, Legend Haste, Last Stand. Okay, and secondary, you can run Bone Plating Overgrowth. You can run Second Wind Overgrowth. You can run Mana Flow Transcendence. And here, if it's a difficult lane, absolutely go Flat Health. If it's an easy lane, you go Scaling Health. The alternative is the Domination page, which is always gonna be Electrocute, Sudden Impact, Eyeball Collection, Treasure Hunter. And secondary will be the exact same runes. Certain games you will run Mana Flow Transcendence, certain games you will run Second Wind Overgrowth, certain games you will run Bone Plating Overgrowth. Um, how do we identify when is the correct place for each different rune set and variation? I made a little bit of a flowchart for you guys so it's easy to see. Um, you could just go down each tree. Uh, if you're versing a melee champion, for example, you can look at the little tier list I made as well. So strong melee champ, let's say you're versing Fizz with Ignite. Okay, you're loading into chaps like versing Fizz with Ignite, look at this flowchart. Okay, I'm versing a melee, is he a strong laner? Yes. Boom, you max W, max E, Conqueror plus Bone Plating, exactly what we talked about earlier. The Conqueror page with Bone Plating is going to give you the maximum combat stats. He has Ignite, so it's important for us to take flat health because we're going to run TP. Uh, we've got the one mana rune, we're maxing W, we need one mana rune, we've got that. And we've got the most combat stats possible for the first three levels, which is probably where the game is going to be decided. Uh, let's say a different example, you are versing, uh, maybe you're versing on this list, you're versing an easy melee champ, you're versing Kassadin, right? Kassadin, we don't need to take bone plating because Kassadin is not going to want to interact with us. What we actually want to do is take mana flow with conqueror we are still going to max we because that's the easiest page against melees uh, but we're actually going to take mana flow and transcendence because that gives us the best scaling uh, with mana flow transcendence we're going to get 25 ability haste from just our build it'll give us the best rotations we might actually take scaling hp into kassadin and the mana flow is going to allow us to just push the wave and move to other lanes because if kassadin doesn't want to fight us we can't force fights on him you know he's just going to stand back farm with q farm with e whatever then we're just gonna, you know, push the wave and move to side lanes, push the wave, roam to our jungler. If let's say we're versing a range champion and we look at the same flowchart, is the range champion a strong laner? If the answer is no, it's pretty simple. You just max WE, you take electrocute, you take mana flow. So you would be doing this page against a weak range laner. You do this page and you can take flat HP if you want, or you can take scaling HP. I think scaling is fine because it's a weak champ. Let's say that an example of a weak champ would be Twisted Fate. You know, Twisted Fate can never kill us. He can never wound it all in. Um, but if he chooses not to fight us, if he if he just plays for the for the Q, Q max, max range Q, we can't interact with him. There's no point taking combat, uh, combat runes like Second Wind or Bone Plating because it's just going to be non-interactive. We just want to take the extra mana from Mana Flow, take the extra cooldown reduction, kill the wave, and uh, just move to side lanes again. If the champion is a strong range champion, let's say uh, the champion is uh, Akshan. Let's say we're versing Akshan. That's where it gets a little bit complicated. You, it's very difficult to play against strong laners if you max your W because you essentially have no wave clear and you put yourself in danger every time you walk up to W the wave to push it, the guy's gonna hit you. So against things like Akshan, Vex, even Ori, uh, it's very hard to play without Q max. That's when you should be considering playing Q max and the next question you ask is, can I actually carry this game on Silas? Like, how do I carry this game on Silas? Do I carry this game by one-shotting the backline, or do I just have to make space for my teammates? If you, for example, have 
a Diana jungle and you're playing Silas mid, you can bet that the enemy team is going to spam MR. They're going to ma they're going to get a lot of magic mantles or even negatron cloaks, or maybe they get an abyssal mask, whatever it is. You're not going to be able to one shot anyone with the QE electric kid second wind build. It's just not going to happen. So in that case, maybe it's better to go Conqueror, even though Conqueror is very bad against a ranged bully. Um, it's going to make your lane worse. It's going to make it feel very bad. But when you get to skirmishes and when you get to team fights, you can actually play the game. So even though you're versing a ranged champ. If the enemy can stack magic resist and there's multiple melee champs on the enemy team, let's say you're versing Rel, you're versing a Xin Zhao jungle, and you're versing Aatrox top. Even though you're playing as the ranged champ mid, they have three melees. So when it gets to team fights, you're going to be able to keep your Conqueror up the whole time because there's so many people for you to hit in the front line. You have low cooldowns, right? And you're just going to weave in and out, be kind of like a frontline tank on Silas, basically. That could be your role for that particular game. But if they don't have three melee champs, then you kind of just have to play. Uh, QE for the lane. So the page will look something like this if I'm versing Orianna and uh, you know they have like Lulu, Jinx, Lulu or something and they have Cannon top, then I'm just going to run this page. And I'm going to hope for the best. I'm going to hope that I can one shot Jinx at some point, Chizo, one shot Cannon. You know, my, my job in the team fights will be to try and flank and, and find a really good angle on their backline to do my full combo with the QE max. However, if it's a bad matchup like Vex, for example, and they're all melee, the rest of the team are mostly melee champs, I might just take the L in lane. I'll say, okay, Vex, I'll go down 10 CS, I'll go down 15 CS, and I'll just take full scaling runes, you know? I'll take the runes that will help me when we get to skirmishes, when we get to the dragon contest, the grubs, they will help me make space for the rest of my team. Now, what I've shown you so far, I just blanket guidelines about how to build an itemize on Silas, and they will work in maybe 80 to 90% of matchups. But the other 10% of matchups are very niche. They're very unique. It's generally against champions that either have stealth or they have dashes. In those matchups, you might think that you should max Q based on the tree chart, but based on the champion identity, you actually can't max Q because, for example, if you play against Aurora and you max Q against Aurora, she has an E dash, she has an alt dash, she has a W dash, she has a stealth. You are never, ever landing your Q on her. Um, and even though the tree chart tells you to, uh, you simply have to take W, E, uh, take second wind and just go oom all the time and pray that you get ahead. That's just one of those matchups where you don't really want to pick Silas, but if you're in that situation, um, then you just have to take an L, take suboptimal runes, and uh, I hope that you can snowball and carry the game. And we'll be talking more about the outlier scenarios like that at the end of this video. Now, this is the final build for Electrocute variation of Silas. I think the one constant is you never change your first two items. A Rocket Belt and Lich Bane are a must. They just have perfect synergy with his abilities. A Rocket Belt is just the most gold efficient, you know, stat padded item you can get to rush. It gives you a really nice active that helps you land your E and your W. I prefer to go Pen Shoes most games uh, because your combo is just about one-shotting someone or being one-shot. Alternatively, if you're versing double AD mid-jungle, you're versing something like, you know, Kha'Zix Jace, boom, go Steel Caps. Uh, if you're versing double AP, you're versing like Lilia Syndra, boom, go Merc Treads uh, instead of Pen Shoes. And our third item, I prefer to go Death Cap. I think that Silas's AP ratios have been nerfed, but that is still an integral part of his kit. And uh, if you already have a bunch of Dark Seal stacks, you can absolutely get a lot of value out of Death Cap. Third, fourth item, you'll most of the time need some pen. I feel like Void Stuff's been buffed enough uh, to prioritize it over Crypt Bloom. I mean, yes, it's a little bit more expensive, but you do just get so much more AP. And when you already have Death Cap, you know, this just increases the, the gold efficiency of voice stuff. Uh, if your team is struggling in team fights, whatever, you need the extra uh, healing with the Nova, you can absolutely go Crypt Bloom. I don't think the 50 ability, 15, excuse me, ability haste changes anything for Silas. So yeah, I pretty much always go void stuff for the electric build. And somewhere along the way, you need to fit either a Zonia's or you need to fit a Banshee's Veil, uh, depending on whether the enemy is AP heavy or AD heavy. Uh, this could be third item. If you're solo frontline, for example, uh, you might want to consider, you know, getting your Zonia so that you can buy more time before your death cap, before your void stuff. Uh, but alternatively, you can just go full damage build and just sort of rely on your skill execution uh, and positioning to keep you alive in fights. Uh, now, the last thing is you should always swap out your boots for Cosmic Drive once you get to full build, because this basically gives you the same move speed as boots does, you know, once you actually hit someone and uh, again, synergizes really well with death cap for the extra AP. Now for the Conqueror page, the first two items, again, they do not change. Rocker Belt is just the best first item you can get on Silas, and you need to build Lich Bane to actually do damage and threaten um, your opponent. 
Now, I personally like to go Merc Treads or Tabbies when it comes to the uh, Conqueror build because you do tend to stay in the fights for a lot longer. Um, so the extra survivability helps. I don't really think uh, pen shoes are that important. Although if you are solo AP and you're doing the Conqueror build, let's say you're playing against Akali, a bunch of melee champs, but you are solo AP, uh, you can absolutely still go pen shoes with this build. It's okay. I just find myself on average going defensive boots more often. Um, also, going defensive boots helps you justify going Riftmaker third and not a defensive item like Banshee Azonia's. I feel like Riftmaker just has amazing synergy with Conqueror, with his W. It's just really the best item you can get third on Silas unless somebody is really fed and you need resist. In that case, if there's a fed AD carry, for example, you know, fed Lucian or something like that, you need to go Zonia's because otherwise you will just get one tapped uh, by the enemy fed AD. But if you have, you know, uh, Tabbies and Zonia's, you can sort of uh, still play the frontline role without uh, dying instantly and get a multiple rotations off, buy time for your team, hopefully make enough space to win the game. Um, I, I do like to fit Riftmaker here at some point, but if you do go Zonia's third, uh, in general, you'll probably need pen on your fourth item. Most of the time, I think most games you need penetration as your fourth item. With this build, though, uh, you can actually go Crypt Bloom because I think that this build is a lot more about um, uptime, a lot more about staying, uh, you know, staying in team fights for longer, uh, healing up. So I think Crypt Bloom is probably the better option for this build. Again, unless you think that you just need to dive the backline to win the game. If you need to dive the backline, of course, you play the one shot. But if you can just uh, be a space maker, space creator. Then I think Crypt Bloom is a solid option. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can also just go Death Cap. You know, if they're not stacking MR, you can go Death Cap fourth as well. You can also go things like uh, Abyssal Mask. I think Abyssal Mask is a really good option. Let's say that um, even third item, right? If they are two or three AP champs, then I might go Rocket Belt, Lich Bane, Merc Treads, Abyssal Mask, and I'm basically full build. I do a lot of damage with each rotation. I have mobility, I have a lot of health. And I'm um, basically unkillable to any AP champs. And also the build is very, very cheap. You can see 2,500, 2,600, uh, super, super effective. The other item that's very, very interesting is, again, if you are solo frontline, uh, solo frontline Silas and you are more of like a tanky engage role, you can also go Unending Despair. So let's say that they have uh, a lot of AD. They have like Irelia. I rarely amid for some reason, they have Aatrox top, whatever. And uh, there's no value out of Zonias because you don't actually want to use your Zonias and go invulnerable because if you do that, your opponents will just run past you and kill your teammates. So if you need to just stay alive in a, in a fight, but you have to stay active, you can't go invulnerable, then I think Unending Despair is actually a really, really nice item. Coupled with Riftmaker, this build gives you so much, uh, you know, so much sustain, so much healing. It's very, very effective against uh, heavy AD drafts. Uh, but if you do if you do end up buying an item like uh, Unending Despair or uh, Abyssal Mask, I would suggest not going Death Cap because you are missing an AP item. So in this case, you just go a Penetration item last. Obviously, uh, you know you go Void stuff if you had an Unending Despair, but if you had Abyssal Mask, then you could go for something like Jack Show. I don't think it makes much sense to go Death Cap with only you know three AP items uh, that give you like 250 AP in total. I think you're better off going with uh, Jack Show and just being more tanky. So to summarize the Conqueror build, you have a lot of different options. The only uh, common trend is that you should ideally go resistance boots and then rift maker third. I think this is the best build in almost all situations, whether they're heavy AP or heavy AD. This build gives you the most uptime, uh, the most spell usage, the most healing, the most everything. And then from here on, you just decide, do I need to be more tanky? Cool. More tanky. Do I need to have more damage? Uh, cool. I can go like this and maybe I don't even go penetration at all. I just go for max healing with the AP ratios. Uh, I'll go for Zonias for more survivability, or maybe I'll go for Banshees for more survivability, whatever it is. It's totally up to you. Just uh, experiment with it, see what you like. But I think this core three items with the boots, uh, you can't go wrong with it in any game on Conqueror Silas. Now, the first thing you need to understand about Silas is that the best part of your kit is your passive, okay? This procs every single time you use a spell, it gives you a charge, and when you walk up to somebody, your next auto will expunge the charge, and it will essentially do a Lich Bane proc to your main opponent, as well as a little bit of AoE damage around you. Now, this can stack up to three times, so if you use three abilities, you will get three stacks. Now, if you use another ability at three stacks, you will not get a fourth stack. However, you can refresh your existing stacks uh, to last for longer. You can see there when your stacks time out, they all time out at the same time. Uh, unlike other abilities, they don't drop off one at a time. Now, there is a tiny bit of a grace period where it might look like the, the passive's already timed out, but it lets you 
uh, get it off on your enemy anyway. So there's a tiny bit of a buffer, maybe like 0 0.2, 0 0.1 seconds extra after the indicator goes away. Now, outside of that, your main combo that you need to practice on Silas is just simply using abilities and uh, weaving in autos after each ability. So one spell, one ability, alt, auto Q, auto W, auto E, auto E, auto, right? So you just, that's the fastest way to attack someone uh, and do your highest DPS combo. And in an ideal world, you can actually get five passives off in one rotation because you have your alt two on your E and one on each other spell. Now, one thing you have to get very, very good at is canceling your auto attack with your W. So it looks something like this, auto W. You can see there that my auto W actually did the damage at the same time. And that's why it came up as a 349. You know, when you get it perfectly, you'll see one number uh, come up instead of two numbers because you timed them at the perfect, uh, in, in the perfect sequence. Now, if you do it too early here, so if I press auto attack and then W too quickly, you can see that my auto attack actually doesn't end up going off before my W. I try to start my auto attack and then cancel it with a W because I pressed it too early. So don't press it too early. And if you press it too late, if you wait too long, then you just look like kind of a noob. You know, you're wasting one second of uh, combat time where you could be getting CC'd very soon. And that one second could have been you getting out the rest of your spells. So try to get very, very good at this auto W, auto W, auto W uh, combo and get it as fast as you possibly can. Now the main combo for W Max Silas is E into E, auto W, auto Q, auto, auto, R, auto, you know, um, that's, it's pretty much as simple as that. Now, if you can get in range without using your E2, you can do even more damage because you won't have, you know, uh, two stacks by the time you start the combo, you can go E, auto W, auto E, auto Q, auto R, auto. And now one thing you can also do is you can combine your E and W animation at the same time. It looks something like this, basically cast together. It's impossible to dodge because it's point and click and you could do the exact same combo uh, as we did before. So you would open with E, W and go like this, E, W, auto, auto Q, auto E, auto R, auto. And that's your max damage combo on Conqueror Silas again. Uh, the other variation is if you wanted to guarantee your Q2 landing, uh, you could cast your Q2 before your E. So you could go E, auto W, auto Q, auto E, auto R, auto. Now another cool combo you can do is E, W, Protobelt, which will actually cast E, Protobelt, W, but you need to press E, W, Protobelt. It looks something like this, E, W, Protobelt. And basically it will cast your protobelt and then queue up your W right afterwards. You don't have to click anything else. All I'm clicking is E, W, protobelt, and then my hands are off the keyboard. Uh, e, W, protobelt, and it cuts your protobelt animation. It looks very, very cool. Does the full damage and closes the distance. Your opponent can't really react to it. Another cool thing you could do is you can, you know, press E2 and then protobelt and uh, cancel your, you know, protobelt animation with the E2. Another thing you could do is you can combine your E2 and W to hit at the same time. Don't really know why you'd want to do this. If you're about to die, if you're very, very low, you just need to get the, the burst damage off as fast as possible. You can go EW like this, and you can see that it comes up with one number for 12. So both of my abilities hit at the same time. Another thing you can do is you can steal someone's ultimate midair as you're flying, which is very, very useful uh, against champions like Amumu. If I do not steal his ultimate while I'm flying, then by the time that I arrive, and I try to steal his ultimate when I'm on top of him. He already comes out of the knockup from my E and he's going to ult me first. I might get CC chained and die. But if I steal his ult uh, midair, then uh, obviously I can free cast it while he's airborne and uh, CC chain him myself and not let him react. Now, if you are going to play the Q max variation with Electrocute of Silas, first thing you need to do is go into your hotkeys, go into abilities and summoner spells, quick cast with the indicator, set a hotkey for this so that you can I'm holding shift plus Q right now, and I can see the indicator. Now the two arrows are the first part of the Q that doesn't do very much damage. It just slows. And the second part is that circle. So it's important to see that, to visualize that and know uh, exactly where that's going to hit. Uh, the whole point of this build is that you slow someone with the first part of your Q, which goes up with level, by the way. So the slow goes up from 15 to 35%, becomes easier and easier to hit your chains afterwards. You slow them with your Q1, right? So you go E forward, you Q1, and then you immediately press your Q2 and uh, you do your full combo, but basically the slow keeps them in place for the E, and then your chains connecting keeps them in place for your Q2. Uh, the rest of the combo is just using your abilities one at a time uh, after each passive. So your full combo will look something like this. E, Q, E, Auto, W, Auto, Auto, R, Auto. And that's basically it. It's uh, very, very straightforward. Uh, you get your full damage combo as long as you hit your Q2, and then you just use your W to uh, generate another passive stack. One thing you can also do is you can hold your W with this combo to chase, use your W as a gap closer. So you can go E, Q, E, 
auto move forward auto auto w auto like this right so you basically keep auto attacking in between your combo but start moving forward and when your opponent flashes away you can follow them with the next uh, w cooldown now if somebody shows up to your lane like a gwen or a Kha'Zix jungle, or a Zeri or something, and you need to kill them. But you cannot do this combo because if you queue like this, they will just dash away. And as soon as they've dashed away, you can no longer land your chains and you basically have zero cooldowns. They can walk towards you because you've used your two most important abilities and they've only used their dash. And you essentially have no way to close the distance. They can kite you and kill you. Uh, so against those types of champions, what you need to do is you need to just open with the Conqueror combo. So you open with E, W, auto auto to get your electrocute once your electrocute procs most likely they will dash away and then you qe at the last second right so lead with ew auto auto qe at the end right once they've used their escape you can qe and absolutely be certain that you've hit it so it looks like this ew auto auto qe right so let your let your e almost time out and lose use it at the absolute last second because if you try to use it early against the champ of the dash it's just not going to work now another cool thing you can do on silas is you can actually e flash so you can uh, cast your e2 and then flash right as it's about to connect to change the trajectory that you come from this is very very important against champions with line skill shots like hui or brand or uh, Ari, for example, where Ari Charm, you can't really buffer that. It's very, very difficult to buffer. So uh, you could just reposition halfway through your animation like this. So I might eat Ari, she's going to charm me, and then I come from the side, okay? And I complete the dodge the skill shot, and I can do my full combo. Now, the second part about Silas E that you need to be aware of is that you cannot cast E2 plus flash. You can't lead with E2. If you press E2 flash, your E2 will actually cast from your starting distance, even though you've queued it up. So unlike other champions like Amumu, this is not possible. So you got to make sure that you press flash first and then E2 right after that, right? Flash first, E2 right after that. Now, when it comes to buffering abilities on Silas, there's just one rule you have to follow to get it right, okay? You need to look for the opponent's animation first before you press E2. If you press your E2 after your opponent presses their stun, you will always buffer it. So it's a game of chicken, okay? And and you have to wait for them to quake first. Here, you can see that I'm getting impatient. I press my E2 first, and Hue is the one reacting to my stun. My stun hits him, he reacts with his fear, and it cancels me halfway during my animation. Yes, I get the damage off on him, but you can see he comes out of the stun while I'm still CC'd. He can do a full combo on me, he can run away, and I have literally zero ways to, to, to close the distance now. Uh, when I come out of the stun, I can't get in range of my W, and I basically lose the trade very, very hard. So that is the wrong way to do the buffering, and the issue there was that I simply cast my ability first. Now, to do it correctly, you need to wait for their animation. You can see here, I put my cursor right on top of him. This is really, really important, guys. If you put your cursor on top of him, you're basically simplifying the work for your brain. All your brain has to do, all your fingers have to do is just press the E button, okay? You've, that's all you have to do. As soon as you see any type of animation from him, you just press the E button. You can see here, I see that he's casting something. I hope it's the stun. That's all you can really do. Time your E as you get stunned. You can see my chains are going off despite me being feared. Now I'm right on top of him. He's still stunned. I can do my full combo and uh, continue to DPS him as he runs away. Now the next ability we'll look at buffering is the W. Buffering your W is impossible, guys. You cannot buffer your W and you should never use W if you think you could be interrupted. So things like Alistair Q. It's something very, very hard to predict when Alistair's going to Q you. Um, and uh, if he Qs it at the right time as you're casting your W, you will essentially uh, lose your W completely. So you won't get any damage off your W. Uh, you'll get obviously interrupted halfway while jumping and CC'd. So you won't really close the distance. You won't get any healing from it. And most importantly, it will go on full cooldown. You can see here, I lead with my EW versus Hui, which is something you shouldn't do. You should lead with EE and buffer his fear with, with your E. Now here, I try to lead with W. I cast my W, I get cancelled halfway, the damage doesn't go off, right? The um, the healing doesn't go off, and uh, it goes on full cooldown. Now the third ability we'll look at is buffering your Q. Uh, your Q can be buffered through anything the same way that your E2 can, uh, and uh, obviously it applies a slow, so it's a nice way to, if your opponent wants to disengage, uh, and they stun you, right? Like Brand stuns you, you can Q them. And then maybe if you're maxing Q, that's a 35% slow. Uh, you're stunned, but they're also slowed running away and that gives you a chance to catch up. Uh, the other thing is your opponent stands still when they cast a spell to stun you. So if you cast your Q at the same time as they're casting their stun, it's very, very likely that your Q2 is going to hit. 
because they're not trying to dodge your Q2. They're too focused on stunning you. So uh, if you are maxing your Q, that's kind of when you need to think about the Q buffers because if you only have one point in your Q, it really doesn't make much of a difference. You can see here, I wait for his animation, same logic as the Emax. We wait for Quay's animation as it hits us. Uh, we get our ability off and uh, uh, you know we're, we're buffering it through the flea, standing still, not running away. And uh, hopefully the slow is enough to uh, keep him in place and help us re-engage. Now let's talk about level 1s on Silas. Silas is one of the best invade champions in the game because you have a dash and you have a stun. And it does a heck of a lot of damage with your passive. So what you want to do is walk in a straight line into this bush like this. You hug and then you walk so that the bush protects you from whoever's in the try. You walk in and you should preemptively use your E as soon as you leave the bush. So as soon as I leave the bush, I'm going to preemptively E and sweep up. Now what that's going to do is if somebody is in the bush, I can basically... Uh, see them as I come in and I can immediately chain just based on the silhouette and get their flash very very quickly Or you can hold your chain until you're in the actual bush, but you actually know where to aim So I go here. I see this guy I can wait until I get in the bush and get full vision of him and then I can uh, I can throw my E and uh, get a, a free flash or at the very least, uh, you know, if he does get away, let's say it's a Caitlyn, she skittles her E, uh, then she'll most likely ward the bush as she's leaving, and my sweeper is going to help me uh, get a free level up for level 2. Another invade you can do is on this side. Here you can just go over this wall, uh, E, walk around, throw your chain backwards to put it on cooldown ASAP, right? Because your cooldown doesn't start until you reactivate your chain. You might see someone here, and uh, you can either wait for your chain or walk around. Totally up to you. If you don't see anyone, you just proceed into the jungle, proceed into the jungle. If you're versing a champion that is going to start Raptors, like Hecarim, um, then you could just walk this way, get all your teammates right behind you, take this Blast Cone, and uh, just punish them being in this bush. It's a champion with Ghost, they just die. Now the other invade variation is through top lane, where if you're versing an Ignite top champion like Riven, or maybe a Darius, um, Fiora, something like that, you could go in here, very often you'll meet them in this bush, and you just preemptively E like this, and uh, if they're there, your team can help you finish them off, or it could just be you and your top lane or whatever. If you don't see them, then you basically walk like this, wait for your E cooldown to come back off cooldown, you sweep in advance, if you see them in the bush, again, you can go for this cheese. Now once you've done this, because you've committed so much time into checking the lane bushes and checking this bush, you should immediately base. So don't don't go deeper into the jungle, just base and retake. You can do the same thing against bot lanes. For example, if you're playing against Ash Jin, a very lane-oriented uh, duo that wants to secure a ward in this bush to make sure they can win lane. Uh, same thing, you just walk from base, you come in, and you can just preemptively E the bush to get there faster. You'll see them walking in, and you'll just... Yeah, you just land your chains with your team and you can kill them. And if this doesn't work, if you don't see them, then your teammates get a ward in this bush, which is very nice for their lane. And you do the same thing with the sweeper, where you pop your sweeper right around here, and then you dash in, and you try and get first blood. Now, if you don't see somebody here, right, if you if you don't see someone in this bush, you should continue walking like this. And uh, the best the best thing, in my opinion, is to sit here, wait for them. Uh, you can you can alternatively just check the blue buff and go back to mid lane. One thing you got to watch out for is when you do this invade, if your teammate is going to start, blue buff you should never walk this way because you can be seen so if you've already started your e just walk the long way around um, in case the enemy mid is camping this bush so that you don't give away your teammates uh, going for the cheese play and there's more of a chance that the enemy will just blindly face check and die now another cheese you can do is if you can sneak into the side bush uh, it's this bush for blue side and this bush for red side because you can get into it quicker than you can for this one right because this is just a way longer distance to run uh, once you're in this bush, often the enemy jungle will be holding here. So if you get into this bush with your uh, jungler or your support or whoever, you can just blindly dash over and just go to chain someone, get a nice little chunk, get a ward on the raptors that way. Alternatively, you can also cheese your laner level 1. Sometimes the laner will hold here, like an Azir. Uh, you can just dash out preemptively. E2 them and uh, get a trade before the minions even come in. And the last variation they should be aware of is often the enemy mid laner will try to ward your raptors, right? They'll, they'll be chilling in this bush where you are and they will wait for the 110, 113 timer. They'll walk in and they'll ward your raptors. So uh, to prevent that, you could stand here against champions that want to do it. For example, LeBlanc or any pushing champ, really. Uh, Talia might do it. Ari might do it. So you could just stand at the edge of this wall where you're not exposed to this bush. You can see that I'm outside of the vision range for that bush. As soon as my opponent comes around, he's going to be in for a nasty surprise. I'm going to lead with an auto and go E auto, you know, E2 auto and just walk with them. And they're going to completely lose their lane. 
Now, the safest, most consistent way to play level 1 on Silas is to take control of this bush, right? The bush next to enemy raptors. It would be the opposite bush if you're on red side because it's the easiest to walk into. You can see if the enemy jungler goes for a dumb cheese. You can see if your laner is checking out, you know, uh, walking up too far mid lane trying to see where you are before the minions spawn. You can try to cheese them with your E. Uh, but the most important thing is you're not skilling an ability, right? Because you're just keeping your options open. You're ready to go ward at about 123. You know, 120, 123, depending on what champions they have. If they have a top laner, they can poke you here. You gotta go a bit later. If they don't, you can go a bit earlier. You can see we see Talia just jump over the wall straight away, get her flash. Now, even if my Graves wasn't there, this would still be a good play. I would still place the Raptor's Ward and I would still fight Talia and I would win because look, her resists 18 armor, 30 MR. And Silas has some of the highest base resists in the game, right? So uh, if you can ever catch your opponent somewhere here, outside of the minions, um, outside of the lane, uh, you're always going to get a favorable trade uh, level one. Now, before we talk about how to actually play the lane on Silas, let's look at the one thing you can never afford to do level one. And that is skill your ability if there's no trade available. Okay, so if nothing happens level one, you need to make sure that you leave a skill point, uh, leave your options open, because if your opponent walks past your wave, you need to skill your E and trade them, even in the worst matchups. Uh, here, for example, I thought I was playing against Akali, so I took the easy melee matchup runes with Mana Flow Transcendence, and I'm versing Jace, which is a hard ranged matchup. So in this matchup, I should have electrocute second wind i realized that in the game i'm like okay well i'm just going to skill my q because i can't win the trades against jace anyway i'm going to skill my q i'm going to get my mana flow proct as soon as possible boom get my mana flow get 40 damage on jace looks good right wrong this guy is now walking past my wave chatting me off xp on the melee creeps i have no choice but to drop half hp to try and stay within range for my melee creeps and my lane is just completely lost from here but imagine if i had e imagine if i had e and he did that i would just dash on him while my triple range creeps are aggroing him and he would lose the lane completely right so uh, the threat of having your e is going to stop these bad matchups from becoming unplayable right so you're going to make sure that you never ever skill q until the creeps are actually low enough for you to last hit and if you do accidentally skill q level one like i did don't show it do not show the guy that you've skilled Q, because as long as you haven't used your Q, he still has to respect the fact that you might have E, and he's not going to chad you past the wave like he did. Now let's have a quick chat about how to play difficult melee matchups on Silas. Uh, in this game specifically, we're versing Kled with Ignite, which is one of the worst lanes possible. Uh, you know, Silas is known for his high... Uh, stats level one, you know, high armor, high health, high MR, but unfortunately Kled has two HP bars. So uh, this champion can stat check you. He has a Grievous Wounds on his Q. He has Grievous Wounds on his Ignite. So really going into this lane, I have a hypothesis of if I survive, if I don't die, if I go even by level four, uh, and I can get my base off potentially with double Amp Tome or like Amp Tome Cloth Armor TP in, uh, that's kind of my win con. That's what I'm playing for. Now the first thing you need to do is, is always auto the minion off cooldown. So just try and prep the minion as fast as possible as much as possible so that your minions are dying at the same time as, as his are right so that he has to choose between csing uh, his minions or harassing you and when the minions get really low like this you have to get creative because if you just walk in a straight line to try and cs them uh, your opponent will very likely hit the uh, spell right and you're going to get chunked out because you don't want to take that trade so you can see i tried to creatively cs that first minion he predicted my dash and he ends up landing his q so i just refuse to trade him right i have my bone planning active i say look i'm just going to walk away and then I'm going to re-engage back in to get the creep. So make sure that you prioritize avoiding damage on Silas in bad matchups rather than dealing it. Okay, so use your spells. If your opponent is posturing like this, once again, same thing. You can see he's posturing past the wave, right? He's standing past the creeps. So if I walk in a straight line to get this creep, it's just not possible. He will uh, chunk me out. So I have to find a creative solution to farm this minion. And uh, we do. We try to uh, get it with our passive, uh, but again, I prioritize dodging his Q, so I go in with my E. He's expecting me to continue the trade, either E2 forward or auto attack him. I walk away, I dodge his uh, I dodge his Q, and then I re-engage back in and let my passive AoE take care of the minion. So, so far so good. We've avoided taking damage. We've got most of the creeps, and you can see again, I'm just autoing off cooldown. This is very, very important. Never ever forcing myself to use abilities on the wave unless my opponent is actually actively posturing on my minions. And uh, now I've got two abilities, so this is a little bit better for me because uh, obviously um, I have two passive stacks. Once again, very difficult two creeps to get here. If we walk in a straight line to these two creeps, we are going to get chunked, so we need to creatively get them with our passive while also 
doing damage to him because no doubt he's going to be inviting us to trade here. So we drop this melee creep. This is very important. Um, don't eat that melee creep because if I eat that melee creep, I'm inviting him to just dash forward into me and win the trade because I have no abilities at all. Um, so be okay with dropping a creep if you're in a position where you're exposed to the enemy trading you. Once again, you know, I'm walking up. I know that he's going to cast a spell. So I'm intentionally trying to dodge his ability before I go for the last hit, trying to fake going for the last hit to try and dodge a spell. And uh, then again, we use all of our abilities on the enemy and let our passive take care of the CRC for us and uh, so far so good we get a little uh, gank from Jarvan uh, doesn't really do too much does put Kled on cooldown which is nice and uh, yeah again we're just posturing on our creeps we're never walking past our creeps we're never egoing him we're just happy with the state of the lane right we're not losing this lane which is a blessing uh, and we're happy to take that. We're just autoing the lane off cooldown. We're not using our spells. We only use our spells once we see, okay, if I don't use my spells here, my Jarvan is either going to die or I'm going to be wasting my Jarvan's time because he obviously wants to contest the camp. He wants to fight Italy. He can't do that if my lane is moving towards him. So I decide to push only when there's actually a benefit, when there's actually value in pushing for me. Uh, now, instead of basing, this is what you can always do in hard matchups, whether it's ranged or melee, just go for a roam because you have your TP. Uh, once you kill someone here, even if you don't kill anyone here, you just base, you'll TP back, you you might lose one or two melees, but really it's a very, very uh, efficient roam. And uh, you can see we end up picking up a double kill here, and this completely swings the game. Now let's have a look at how to play an easy matchup on Silas. We're playing against Galio in this game. First thing we did, uh, like we talked about, is control this bush. Our teammates want to go for the invade, uh, so we walked with them. I did a preemptive E in the bush in case somebody was there. There was nobody there. The invade is over. Now the benefit of this is that we got that ward and red buff, so we no longer need to do a raptor's ward. However, the opponents could have taken space in our jungle. So we are ready to retake with our Viego. Make sure you do not AFK, you do not recall randomly. If you do an invade like that, your jungler wants to start their own camps. You need to go with your jungler, link up with them, and uh, be ready to fight. Be ready to, to take the space back, to take the territory back, and uh, protect your jungle with your life. Now, uh, we cleared out the most important bushes. They could have still been here. I'm not sure why he didn't care about checking it, but he didn't. And uh, now we're going back to mid lane. So uh, in this matchup, again, any sort of melee matchups on Silas, if you can land E1, Auto, E2, auto, that's going to be a winning trade. So if you see that through the wave, you can see here, um, I look for the angle. Uh, right when they're standing between the two uh, back wave and the front wave, you can often get this trade level one on Silas. And it's always going to be favorable for you because not only are you, uh, you know, getting all your abilities off on the enemy, but you're actually AoEing the entire wave with your passive, which is going to get you level two first. And uh, that's what we like to see. Now, after the trade's over, again, I'm not posturing overly aggressively. I'm just last hitting with my autos. I'm last hitting with my autos. And this one is really, really important. Feel free to use your E to dodge damage from the enemy. If the opponent has an ability like Talon Rake, for example, you can use your E to dodge Talon Rake then use your E2 last second. You can see here I used my E2 last second. And now my opponent has no abilities, but I still have mine. Even though I don't have E, the most important thing in the melee matchup is your passive. Now I have two stacks of the Silas passive, so I can walk up um, you know, and, and offer a trade on him. I'm going to win that trade because I have two abilities and he has one. He just has his passive and I have two passives. And uh, alternatively, I can always just uh, play to push the wave as well. If he if he respected that, I would just walk up and uh, equalize push on the wave by ordering the minions. Uh, I got the best of both worlds. I was able to hit him and the wave. Once again here, he's on cooldown. Now, that was actually a bad E. I should have saved my E and postured aggressively and just dropped the one creep because he was on cooldown. Uh, but, you know, I just greeted for one minion. That is what it is. I went to ward for my Viego. I can see my Viego is in the enemy jungle, so we need to actually protect my Viego from getting traded on, be able to see if the enemy jungler wants to walk in. Um, outside of that, again, I'm just playing a very conservative style. Uh, even though this is an easy melee matchup, I know that my champion comes online level 3. I don't need to force anything level 2, I just want the wave to be in the right position for level 3. Now here, Viego does an amazing job, and I can't stress how good this player is. The fact that he walks around the long way and uh, actually leaves me with full XP, Right, because if he walked this way, he would have sapped the XP of my minions, but he walked the long way, so that's a really, really nice play from Viego. And uh, I know that right now in Gallia's head, he just eat away, so he has no escape. Plus, he's also thinking about, is Viego going to stay here and, and deny me this creep? You know, he's just thinking about getting the melee creep. He's not thinking about my abilities. He's not thinking about my level up. And you can see here, this is really, really important on Silas. You guys need to do this if you want to land your E. You need to click back and forth, back and forth. If you just walk in a straight line after leveling up, if I just walk in a straight line at this guy, he's just going to walk away in a straight line as well. He's going to mimic my movement subconsciously. Even if he's not thinking about, he's just going to drop this creep because I look too scary. 
it looks like I'm coming straight at him and he's going to walk away. So you have to put yourself in the right position, right? Put yourself in range of using your spells, which is around here, right? If he wants to XP this minion, max range, you know, I need to be standing around here. But at the same time, I don't want to be standing too far because if I'm standing too far, it's too obvious and he's just going to drop the minion. And at the end of the day, we don't care about this minion. Like, yes, if he loses XP on this minion and gold, great, but it doesn't actually change our lane. What changes our lane is a full on trade, landing all of our spells level three. You can see here, I click away, I click back, I click forth. He's very confused. He's also clicking back and forth. And then we get our abilities off and uh, it's a uh, straight up solo kill. He's not expecting the damage, but that's just the power of Silas guys. As soon as you hit three, your champion becomes broken. So if you just have full resources, full mana, full HP, you hit level three first, or even at the same time, uh, that's when your champ comes online. Now here's an example of an easy matchup. Uh, we're playing against first strike Kaiser mid. Now, as any 80 carries mids go, you know, even against Zeri or Smolder level one, uh, they are stronger than you unless you can land your E2. So most games you should be comfortable starting Q. And you can see here, uh, I'm not making that same mistake from the previous clip, right? I'm not skilling any abilities. I am leaving it up to my opponent if he plays it correctly. And the correct way to play it for him would be to stand here, right? Stand behind the melee creep right on top of it slash slightly behind it and just auto me if I walk up for the wave and if I don't walk up for the wave then he forces me to use my Q and then he's going to try and posture on the range creeps uh, once he knows that I've started my Q right but here because he doesn't know which ability I've started uh, he needs to respect and stand behind his creeps if you see your opponent crossing this line this is the line of no return if your opponent stands on your minions and not his minions this is when you can skill E last minute and go for a trade so if they stand on this line you trade if they stand on this line you respect and you skill your Q last second and you get the last hits and you just play for your you know level two level three trades you just ignore level one you can see that you know she just stood way too far from the wave I knew I could get my uh, my E2 on her and the passive subsequently did the rest on the wave I didn't even have to worry about last hitting um, but like all range matchups go, you're gonna lose push on the first wave. That's completely natural. Don't feel like you have to turn this, you know, turn this lane around from level one. Even though we got a favorable trade there, you can see that's a minion that you should always drop, right? If the the, the general rule of thumb on Silas, if you're gonna take more than a hundred damage for a minion, you should never ever go for that minion. Just drop it. A um, hundred damage is not worth it. So one auto attack for a minion is totally fine. But if you're going to take auto plus ability, like I took Q plus auto in that case, or if you're going to take double auto, if you're going to take two autos in the ability, it's very, very bad. So just drop the minion. You know, I dropped that extra range creep there. Uh, totally fine. No worries. And now here it's very, very important as well, guys. Even though Kaisa is fogging here, there is a chance that she's going to walk up. Maybe not right now for the melee creeps, but once I'm going to go for these range creeps, there's a very high chance that she actually comes back into the lane and tries to harass me, right? So you got to make sure that you do not use your E to CS on the tower unless you absolutely have to, or you know that your opponent is not gonna is not gonna posture on the wave. Because here, if I use my E to to get any of these creeps and she walks up, I'm in a lot of trouble. But if I save my E and she walks up, I, I'm happy to drop the couple of these creeps, dash past them, right? Once you've already got all the melees, you can always drop the range creeps, dash past them and go for a trade. Because she's on your side of the map and uh, it's very easy for you to land your abilities when there's no minions in the way. So yeah, just try to auto with last hits and only use your E at the very last second once you know for sure that the range champ is not going to try and harass you under tower. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, placing that ward is a huge mistake for Kai'Sa because now we're going to hit level 3 at the same time. I, I try and get a first strike there. I think in general you shouldn't use your Q like that. It's a very specific first strike thing. Again, uh, you know, she's not expecting me to level up because she didn't realize that creep is walking into tower. And uh, we end up getting a, a quick and easy solo kill here. So uh, just a little bit of patience, level one. Uh, making sure you keep your options open about which ability you're going to... Uh, level, you're going to skill, uh, punishing your opponent, and uh, level 3 comes around and you're just, you're in Silas Paradise. Uh, here's an example of a bad matchup. We're playing against uh, 1000 LP challenger Ignite Akshan one trick. Uh, never, never a fun lane to be in. Uh, but uh, if you just come in with realistic expectations and you play the matchup how it's supposed to be played, you can absolutely survive even, uh, you know, if you're blind picking and getting countered on Silas, you can see that I have avoided this bush. Um, I did not go into this bush because I came 10 seconds late from base. If you're ever AFK um, or you're just late to get into this bush, just avoid it like the plague because everybody loves it. And if you're the second person walking in, you're probably going to get chunked. So I've taken a safer position. I made sure to stay on the you know the opposite side of where the MV is coming from. I'm giving myself the most time to get out. And uh, if nothing happens, then as my wave is coming in, I'm going to go back 
mid and I want to make sure that I walk with this wave because there is a wave to get it to get an advantage even in, in the hardest matchups by pulling the wave. So a lot of the time if you play against difficult matchups like LeBlanc, Akshan, that sort of thing, uh, they might go to walk ward your raptors here they might ward your raptors here and if you see that they're not showing on the wave that they're not protecting the wave you can walk up once the minions meet you can walk up and auto the the middle melee creep you can see here if you auto the middle melee creep as a melee champion you will actually take aggro of the entire wave and that will firstly make the enemy minions focus fire but most importantly it will pull the wave towards you, you can see it there instead of having to access these melee creeps in the middle now the melee creeps are on top of my range creeps and it's a lot easier for me to play this lane so uh just because you're playing a hard matchup don't use it as an excuse to stay afk right just uh uh, make sure you actually try and get every advantage possible. You can see there, I started my Q. Uh, you know, I ended up dropping the creep because I queued him, but I think it is worth it because I got his blown plating. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're just trying to use our Q to generate an empowered auto attack to get the minions. So uh, while kind of zoning him off the wave as well. So we, we, we managed to survive the first lane very well. I mean, this is a very good outcome on the first lane for Silas. We're just trying to match his level two here. Uh, I know that I'll hit level 2 around the same time his, he does. Uh, it was a bit unfortunate I didn't land my E there. If I landed it, it would have been fantastic. He had no burn plating. So we're actually ended up winning a, uh, a, a very hard losing lane. Uh, but we're not trying to push our luck, right? Like we, we've had pretty much the best level 1, level 2 start possible. You can see he's inviting a trade by dashing forward like that. And I'm not buying it, right? Because I had three range creeps that were going to focus fire me there if I fought him if I opted into the trade and it just wouldn't be good for me. So against these kind of champs, you know, they will try and provoke you. They will try to uh, make you feel bad. They will try to look like they're about to take a bad trade, but in reality they're not because they just have so much more stats than you, uh, especially if they take Ignite. So just make sure you don't, you don't buy into their funny business. You just play safe, last hit from afar, you know, do the occasional Q poke, wait for your level 3. Level 3 is when your champion really comes online. You can see how, how again, I'm not wasting my abilities on the wave because when he walks up, I need to have everything ready to fight him. Uh, so I can dash past the wave and, and uh, threaten a trade. That way he has to play safer and he can't harass me as much on every creep. But what I did was I was just trying to set up the creeps um, so that I can get them with just one auto uh, and a tower shot. As long as, obviously, he's not actually posturing that aggressive. You can see again... This is a really, really important technique that you need to do is sometimes if you walk up to a minion, it is too obvious for him. I walk up to auto this minion, he will auto me or he will go Q auto, uh, Q double tap auto, get a shield and then uh, my tower will do no damage to him. So here I can't walk up to auto it. I need to actually Q him because if I Q him, I'm going to get the minion at the same time and he's actually not going to be able to hit me back because he's slowed um, and it's harder for him to tether. So uh, whenever your opponent is making the posturing too obvious, just use your Q to uh, scare him off and give yourself an easier time to trade. Now that one's really, really nice. You can see that I used my passive to get the cannon, but in reality, what I was looking for was a trade on him. I was happy to drop the range creeps. I was happy to drop a melee creep uh, because at the end of the day, if the range champ is harassing you on the tower, they're opening themselves up to an opportunity like that, where, you know, if you used his E there as well, it would be even more hard winning. And uh, now the lane is just completely over. We're just doing what we talked about in the Gallio clip, where we're just posturing back and forth. We're spam autoing the wave and we're just clicking forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Uh, we're just not uh, giving away our game plan to him. And we get a solo kill in uh, probably one of the hardest matchups in the game for Silas. And that all just came down to the way that we played level one, right? The way that we played uh, right here. And we actually autoed the melee creep to pull the wave. Because he wasn't there to stop us doing this, this just completely wins your lane. Now, if the enemy jungler ever does a mid cross gank with three camps at around 2.30, your goal is just to avoid them like the plague. Do not try to damage the enemy jungler. Do not try to trade them. Just respect, walk out, drop a creep if you have to, and uh, focus on your own resources. Because whatever damage you do back to them, you might feel emotional. You might feel like you have to strike back. But if you take any sort of damage, they're just going to heal it off the next jungle camp. And you're going to be stuck in that bad condition forever. Remember to abuse buffering of CC, uh, like we talked about at the start of this video, it's very, very practical and uh, if your opponent is ever standing outside of his wave, uh, you should always look for those opportunities and skill check him to see if he understands uh, the dynamic of buffering correctly or not. If you're about to be the recipient of a gank on Silas, make sure that you switch your position to the opposite side of where the gank is coming from. Force your opponent to stand diagonally to keep the creeps between you and them to avoid the uh, the chain trade, right? And uh, that puts them in the perfect spot for your teammates to come in and snatch up a free kill. 
Remember that your E2 does damage when it initially connects and not when you arrive. So if you stand outside of tower range and E somebody in tower range, you can do damage to them and close the distance without taking aggro. You can see here, I clicked away after pressing my E2. The chains connect, but I don't actually take any tower aggro because I was outside of the tower range. Then I wait for my rel to start taking the aggro and I do my full combo and we get the kill. So I uh, abuse this technique in the 1v1 in skirmishes uh, to close the distance without putting yourself in harm's way. Now sometimes your opponent will be under tower thinking that they're safe because they have a creep in front of them. But if you can quickly last hit the creep with your E auto attack, you can recast your chain immediately and your opponent won't know what hit him. Now whenever there is a low HP counter minion on Silas, you need to posture aggressively even though it might look like a big wave and very difficult for you to land your E2. Remember, you will get four passives in one single rotation, plus your Q AoE is also going to hit the wave, so you'll have no problem killing ranged creeps during your trade and uh, allowing you to land your E2 at the very end. You can see here I lead with my Q, then I go auto W using my W as a movement ability, then I go another passive, E forward, another auto, and at this point I'm already past the wave and we get a nice easy solo kill. So uh, don't use a big stacking wave as an excuse uh, to not look for angles. The angles are there, and the more you look for them, the more creative you're going to get, and the more uh, cool solo kills like that uh, you will see in your games. Now Silas can have incredible impacts in the jungle skirmishes, even without many resources. As long as you have 200 health and 200 mana, that's all you need. You can see here, I'm very, very low. I have TP, I have enough to buy, you know, Dark Seal Amp Tome. So uh, most people would just instantly autopilot recall after catching this wave. But what I want you guys to do is always move your camera to the jungle skirmish. And if your jungle is already winning, then you kind of hinder his ability to progress this lead by, uh, you know, recalling when your mid laner isn't. So just always kind of think about whether you can contribute and uh, don't underestimate Silas's E range early game. It's very, very deceptive. If somebody doesn't have flash, it's very easy to reach them. And uh, all you really need is just to have your full combo uh, to contribute. Now, it's always good to go for these roams on Silas uh, when you see your jungler is doing something proactive around the map. However, you should always keep your options open. If your opponent is following you in a very obvious way, be willing to just turn back on your laner. You know, here I was intending to help Maokai kill Karthus, but the Ryze just walked into me to try and contribute, to try and stop me from, uh, you know, getting to that play in time. And uh, in that case, you just turn on your laner and do what's best for yourself. Now, when you're close to hitting level six on Silas, you want to try and bait out a few abilities by posturing aggressively. Now here, Brand doesn't feel like he's threatened by me because he can see I'm very far away. I'm level five to six, so he feels more uh, free to use his abilities to try and poke me. And he thinks that even if he misses a spell here, you know, there's not much I can do because there's a wave in the way. Now I'm thinking about my level up, right? I'm one creep away from six. So as soon as I hit six, I want to be in a position to dash on him here. You can see here, I'm not hitting this creep. This is very, very important, guys. The creep that gives you the level up, you should never ever see us at always drop the gold and just use it as a way to close the distance. Because if I was already level six here and I started walking forward, this would be my brand's movement. He would just mirror me, identical. He would drop the couple of creeps and just respect and go recall, right? And we don't care about him dropping a couple of creeps. We want to actually kill him. So we want him to only realize that we've hit six once we're as close as possible, right? This creep is dead. I'm six. He's like, oh, crap. And uh, we'll be able to get the uh, the solo kill if we use this creep as a way to get closer. Uh, we dodge his uh, main stun ability and uh, we get an easy solo bolo. So uh, try this in your games. Make sure that you posture aggressively as the creep that's about to give you a level up. It could be your level 3, level 4, uh, but especially relevant at level 6 uh, to make sure your opponent doesn't walk away too early. Now, once you get level six on Silas, instead of just thinking about roaming to side lands and roaming to help your jungler, you can go for solo invades as well. If you know exactly which camp the enemy jungler is on, you can just walk in with a stolen ultimate. If you have a good ultimate that does a lot of burst damage, just walk in and completely uh, 100 to zero the enemy jungler. It's very, very frustrating for them and they really don't expect it most of the time. Now the same way that you can invade the enemy jungler on his camps once you hit six on Silas, you can do the same for your own jungle. If you see that your jungle is on the opposite side doing a play, you can walk into your camps and defend them. Uh, most of the time you will hit six before the enemy jungler does and uh, you can get a very, very easy solo kill. Uh, so here I walked away until the vision was expired and I'm waiting for Brand to use his abilities on the camp so that I get my level up. As soon as I get my level up, he doesn't expect it, and we get a nice, quick, easy solo kill uh, on the jungle camp. 
Now when you get ganked, remember that Silas has very, very high base stats and you're a very tanky champion, so don't panic, don't instantly flash away, just start walking towards the side of your jungler. You can see here, I got the trade-off on Victor because I could tell that Skana was too far away to do anything, and I'm holding my flash. I'm not flashing too early, I'm really making them work for this kill, making myself look appetizing. I end up dodging two abilities with my flash and... Uh, uh, make them commit into the point of no return and we ended up not only protecting the mid gank but actually uh, getting a kill on Skana, uh, chunking out Victor and completely winning my lane so yeah once again do not panic uh, when you play Silas and you're getting ganked think about which ability can I dodge with my E which ability can I dodge with my flash what is the highest value uh, usage of my summoner spells and if you can greet it absolutely greet it now whenever you're walking from base on Silas you have what we call in pro play death tempo it basically means that you're going to be first to the next play if you just run to the play from base so if anything is happening on the map an objective is being contested like a jungle camp here you should just go to the play instead of going to your wave because if you go to your wave you basically show the opponent exactly where you are and where you can and can't be but here the enemy team has not seen me on the map for more than 30 seconds so nobody's tracking where i can or can't be i'm making sure to stay in fog of war staying away from this ward i go straight to the play i wait for kha'zix to completely face check me and get a uh a free kill uh for my efforts and uh end up extending the skirmish and picking up another one on poppy as well so make sure that always unless your wave is frozen uh you just kind of walk to a play if there is an existing one on the map and uh, try to make the most out of your death tempo now let's talk about your role as Silas at Grubs. It pretty much just comes down to controlling this bush. Now you don't necessarily need to be standing in the bush to control it because if the opponent has a ward or a red, red trinket, they can always check you. So it's often beneficial to stand right outside of the bush if you have vision in it because then your opponent will blindly face check without seeing anything on their, uh, on their sweeper and you can uh, land your E max range uh, from Fog of War that is undodgeable for them and uh, basically chunk them out before they even have a chance to fight. I can see here, Kane face checks because he feels like his sweeper has given him enough vision to walk in, but because I'm standing outside of the bush, uh, he ends up dying for free. So that's a good trick to use, so make sure you avoid red trinkets by standing outside the bush if you can. We are once again following the same philosophy of defending this uh, donut bush. We'll call it donut bush. We have another name here for it in Oceania that is not very broadcast friendly. Uh, so uh, all you wanna do is just uh, not let your opponent enter this way uh, to the fight. So just try and split up the fight, make sure that you're always gonna be first to this fight, but don't engage this fight with your teammates if you know that your mid will, will enter second, right? Because whoever enters the fight second generally wins. So it's always better if the enemy mid is close enough to just attack the enemy mid instead, because not only is this going to, uh, you know, force them off and let you uh, play the 2v3 with your team, but if you do end up chunking this guy, then no matter what happens at grubs here, whether you get grubs or whether you lose, whether your jungler dies or lives, it's all irrelevant because your lane is already won, right? You've already chunked your laner, you're going to go back to mid, and uh, his condition's bad, the dynamic has completely shifted. So whenever you go to these grubs, think of them as an opportunity to get yourself ahead instead of an opportunity for you to sacrifice your lane to get your team ahead. And one thing you could do on Silas is pretend like you've based. Here, I'm very, very low resources. Smolder's going to assume that I've based. She thinks that her advantage is that she has mana, so it makes sense for her to stay for the next wave and try to greed push the next wave because she has the resources to do it. Uh, but instead, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stand and fog right behind the wall. As soon as I see her use a key ability, I'm going to show, wait for her uh, movement spell to be finished before I cast my chains and pick up a nice, easy solo kill. Now another cool thing you can do when fake roaming on Silas is uh, potentially fog topside for grubs or walking into an invade and then play around this wall, okay? This wall is really, really strong uh, because it uh, makes you be as close as possible to your enemy without them seeing you. Now what you have to do is you can't wait for the creeps to show because if you see, once you see the creeps, the creeps will see you, right? So you have to play on this fog line, ready to jump forward as you visualize, right, Victor and the wave. I'm expecting Victor to stand behind the first creep. So as I think this first creep is about to come out of vision, I'm gonna try and time my dash preemptively and go towards Victor. And you can see here, he is on the first creep. As we said, he's not walking past the creep, so it's a pretty good player. He's respecting that I could uh, cheese him on this wave, but he's not respecting hard enough because at this point, once you have Hextech Alternator, all you need to do is just land your EW E2 and then do a couple autos and the trade is won. You can see there how I didn't fit any autos between my EW and the E2. I just prioritized landing my E2 
overdoing any autos because if I wait, um, you know, he's going to get behind the creep and I won't be able to do any damage to him at all. So this is a really, really nice cheese to do. You just have to kind of download your replays, go into the timing and get really good at dashing out as the minion's about to get vision of you. You dash out immediately uh, be ready to cast your E2 and you'll get a, a really nice unexpected trades on most sort of mage champions. Now always try and be aware of what's happening on the map whenever you have teleport on Silas. If you ever find yourself in base ready to TP back to lane, uh, just check the other lanes really quickly. See if somebody's getting dived, see if there's a dive opportunity for you, if there's a counter gank opportunity for you, because it's always more profitable to TP to a play like this, because now I've killed their top laner, I'm going to get the exact same lane mid lane that I would have gotten, and there's nobody to stop me from getting the plates, right? So I've got the wave, I'm going to get plates top, and my top laner, once he respawns, will gladly cover the mid wave. And uh, overall, I'm up a lot of gold, and all it takes is just a little bit of map awareness to do this. Now again, this is another example where we have our teleport back up. Uh, we see something happening on a side lane, so it seems like a good roam window. You know, even though it is nine minutes in the game, it's not kind of your first teleport, it's your second teleport. Same concept that applies, we're just going to walk to the play, see if there's any free kills to pick up, because otherwise we can just recall and TP back to mid lane anyway. Uh, we end up walking top, picking up a free Camille kill, instantly basing to catch our wave. But here, what we notice, right, is uh, that our bot lane is actually playing really aggressive. Our bot lane is playing for the dive between the two towers. And uh, in hindsight, knowing that our victor is going to get a turn here, the most likely place for him to go is bot, right? The, his top lane is already dead. His jungle is off the map, so he only really has one play. So when you see this type of thing where the enemy team only has one way to spend their mid roam or to spend their jungle jungle gank timer, you can TP, even without the empowered teleport, just TP on your own turret and try to sneak in to the most aggressive bush possible. So here I'm anticipating this victor roam and he's not anticipating me TP. Nobody's looking at that tower and seeing that TP. Um, and I get into the most aggressive bush possible and hopefully Victor does uh, commit to the roam and uh, I can get a very, very easy counter gank. Now he doesn't commit to the roam, but Kaiser of course doesn't expect me to be here. Uh, it's a very big surprise, we miss our chains, but it's just a very, very nice and easy kill. So whenever you see these opportunities to TP on uh, a side lane to counter an ongoing gank or a gank that you can see coming from a mile away, uh, please do it. Whenever you're playing skirmishes on Silas, always think about what CC your champions can offer to help you land your E easier. In this case, because uh, both of the enemy champs are focusing my Leona, I can see they're very tunneled on her, and I don't hesitate. I use my E at the very start of the skirmish instead of trying to walk through the Alistar and get melee range on Kai'Sa and then risk that you know Alistar's body blocking it, whatever. So whenever you have a guaranteed E2 opportunity, just take it. Take it to get on the back line. Don't greed your abilities. Just use them as fast as possible. The whole point of the Silas build is that you have a lot of ability haste. And the faster you use your abilities, the faster they come back off cooldown. Now, one thing you guys got to remember about second grubs, Rift Herald, and Dragons is that while the objectives are nice, the whole purpose of them is to start the fight. So if you ever see an opportunity to take a fight at the objective on Silas, you should always take it. With this build, you can be a primary initiator frontline type champion. So feel free to go in first, start the fight, ignore the objective, just get your teammates on the same page as you. Whichever jungle tunnels on the objective generally loses these kind of sequences. Uh, now when we go in here, it's also important that you think about which ultimates you want to take. Now because we started the fight, we're obviously going to take the most damage from everyone. So in general, 90% of the time, Ash ult is the go-to on Silas, right? It has an insane AP ratio, it helps you land your E2, it also does a pretty good chunk of AoE damage, and uh, just overall it's a really good ultimate to take. But because we're playing that frontline uh, initiator role, our job is not to one-shot anyone. Our job is just to buy time so that our teammates can catch up and we can win this skirmish. So instead of taking the Ash ult, we're going to take the Lulu ult, right? Because we are just holding the space that we've taken. We're holding the space. We are surviving. That is our role with this Silas build in this specific point of the game. So uh, always make sure that you actually assess your role instead of just blindly taking the ultimate that the, you know, the wiki tells you has the highest AP ratio. Now, you're pretty fed on Silas. You finally find yourself on a side lane. How do you progress the game from here? The easy question you have to ask is, can I kill my laner? Okay, and that's the only thing that matters. If you can kill your laner, if you can tower dive him, uh, or find a way to cheese him before he gets to the wave, then that is the easiest way to progress the game. Because at the end of the day, our only goal is to kill the top tower. So once you kill your laner, don't go to a second play, don't double down, right? Just go back to your wave and start smashing the tower, start breaking open the map, so that the next time when they have no, no top tower, you can actually push a wave, move towards mid, 
force your side laner to stay top and have a numbers advantage on mid lane. Silas has really good ways to dodge in and out of tower range. Uh, you've got your E, you've got your proto belt. Uh, so just be patient, make sure your abilities land, make sure you're 100% certain that your E2 will land before you start taking tower aggro. Here I'm letting Akali do the dance, and then we do the trick from the uh, the practice dummies that we showed at the start of the video with the E2W at the same time. And uh, we basically get a whole combo off before she's able to react. Uh, drop the tower aggro with our proto belt and continue working on progressing the game. So we've taken the enemy bot tier 1 tower, we've taken the enemy top tier 1 tower, how do we break the mid tower on Silas? The way you do it is by generating a turn, right? We need to generate a turn on a side lane, we need to catch this wave in neutral, which is going to get us a turn, because it's going to make Camille show and catch the wave. And we want to, as soon as we've killed the wave, we want to start walking and taking space. We need to take space in their jungle in order to actually progress this game. Now, the first thing you need to understand is that this wave is like a walking ward. But it doesn't just start being a walking ward from when it sees Camille, right? When it sees Camille probably around her tower and when she starts last hitting it, it's already a walking ward for me. Because I can tell that as soon as this wave has already reached this point, once this wave reaches this point and goes past this wall, it is very inefficient for Camille to still be in this bush cheesing me because even if she cheeses me here unless I actually die while we're fighting she is losing this wave to her incoming wave right she's going to have an incoming cannon wave focus firing my wave and uh, she's just fighting me in the tri bush so unless she actually gets gold from this she's just bleeding 150 from the wave uh, so as soon as this wave reaches past this point this is when you should feel comfortable taking this space right this wave unlocks this space. So that's the first space we're going to take, right? Um, we're going to walk with the wave. Camille's not anywhere near us. We're going to sweep just in case she's doing something dumb. She's not there. It's not watered. Great. Camille still hasn't shown. So now there's only two options of where Camille could possibly be. Camille is either below me in this bush, again, trying to cheese me because she thought that, I mean, I have two options, right? I'm either going to go one, two, or I'm going to go one, two. She doesn't know whether I'm going to go this way. Or I'm going to go this way. So she could either be cheesing in this bush or she's completely playing it safe and just standing near her tower. Either way, if I do one, two, that is the safest thing for me to do. Because, uh, you know, if if she decides to cheese me at this red buff bush, I can always take this blast cone and get out. Or I can always pay with flash for it. And once again, she's dropping a full bot wave. So it doesn't make sense for her to do that. So we're slowly advancing. We're slowly taking the space as it becomes more and more obvious where she is. Now we get into this red buff bush. This is the best position you can be in. So every single time you push a side wave, your goal is to get into this bush. Uh, because it's usually not warded. It's like a very low value ward for the enemy to place. And it puts you right in between of the two uh, potential plays, right? You can wrap on mid lane if something happens. And if nothing happens, you can always just go back to bot lane, catch another bot wave and repeat the same process, right? And if you don't think something's going to happen here, it's important that you leave as soon as possible uh, to avoid getting caught and also uh, to make sure that the Camille doesn't get a free turn in return. Uh, now we end up uh, committing to the roam because we see the Rakan's out of position. We get an echo ult, we get a kill on Rakan, and here we should always just go back to bot wave, repeat the same process. Camille has to come towards mid to defend the tower, but by going bot wave and pushing this bot wave, we're going to draw her away, and that's going to give our teammates a 2v3 mid to hopefully siege this mid tower. It's also going to give us the most gold on everyone because now we're pushing all three lanes at the same time, right? If I just go back bot, farm another wave. Um, and that's basically just good macro in a nutshell. That's how you break open the game by uh, pushing your wave, slowly taking the space one bush at a time, deciding do I commit the full way or do I go back and try on the next turn? Try to do the exact same thing in the next 30 seconds and see if something changes. So one thing you need to remember is if you are losing the side lane matchups, you cannot generate a turn. Uh, it's just not possible because if you walk up to the neutral wave, uh, you will simply get cheesed from one of the bushes. It might be the uh, river bush, it might be one of the lane bushes, but the enemy Camille or Fiora or Udia or whatever the fed side laner is, he's going to be there. And as soon as you use any abilities on the wave, he will come out and he will just uh, kill you very, very quickly. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to, again, let our wave scout for us, re-enter this bush and go the safe way towards mid. Because again, uh, we, we're just hypothesizing that the enemy top laner knows they can kill us, and so they're just going to sit in a bush, and we're going to use this opportunity to roam mid. Now, the next thing we need to think about is where does the enemy have vision? When you guys 
do cheat roams like this, where you do not have a turn and you are losing CS for doing this roam, the most important thing is you cannot be spotted by vision. Uh, based on how Kled is playing and the fact that he has no tower, we can safely assume that somebody is behind Kled because he would just would not be playing this far up uh, without help. So we know that somebody is in the enemy topside jungle behind him, probably the support or the jungler. If the support or jungler are topside, then most likely the wards are somewhere here, right? Maybe the midline bush is warded. Maybe this uh, ramp entrance to raptors is warded. Maybe this tribe bush is warded. But this is very unlikely to be warded because they're currently making a topside play. So our only goal is to not be spotted by the minions. We wait for the minions to go past and then we sneak in. Uh, to try and catch the enemy AD carry on the mid wave. We don't know exactly how many people are top, two or three, but we know that for a fact we have three people mid and at most they can only have their AD plus jungle. And uh, we do end up getting a really nice kill on Jin. We actually force Camille to TP. To P uh, Camille was actually stuck on the bot wave uh, trying to cheese us. And uh, this is a much easier way of dealing with these feds, flip push champions, rather than trying to flip the 1v1 in the side lane. So if you don't know what to do, just cheat roam mid, avoid vision, and see what you can find. When it comes to late game, the death time is a very, very long. So generally when your teammate dies on a side lane, the opposing side laner will always greet for the next wave because they want to min max how much gold they get off the kill. Uh, so you can preempt this uh, by TPing early and uh, catching them off guard on that next wave. Uh, in this case, I get a free kill on Mordekaiser for doing it. Now, the other thing you have to remember is kills in the late game are just that. They're just kills. The 300 gold, it really doesn't make a difference because uh, you have all the items already. So here we have a team fight where I go in, I use the Hecarim ult to buffer uh, CC, and then I flash the next load of CC, and I basically started the fight for my team. They're going to clean up this, uh, this rel. It's very, very easy picks. But you have to remember, again, these kills mean nothing if there's no objectives up. So if there's no objectives up, we need to push the waves. The only objectives are the tier 2 towers. So as soon as the fight is over, you need to start walking to the closest lane that isn't occupied by anyone and get that lane into the tower, get an objective for your troubles. Remember that the easiest way to win late game is to simply start a fight up a man because even if your engage is not perfect even if your execution is not perfect you're just gonna win it because you have more players in this specific case they're pushing double side lanes and they're trying to contest baron at the same time so i just pull the trigger even though braum is not a great person to start the fight on you can see we do our full combo we engage we proto belt away to avoid getting one shot and then we re-engage once our spells are back up now when it comes to late game team fights you're very very tanky on silas and you want to try and play in two turns so you want to use all your spells get your max conqueror stacks, use your rocket belt to get away, and then re-engage the fight again uh, once your abilities are back up. You can see that we kind of baited the engage, and then once we have all our spells back up again, we've already got the maxed out conqueror stacks. We go back in, uh, we get the massive AoE with the Aurelia ult and uh, clean up the team fight nice and easy. So uh, don't stress if you don't kill someone straight away at the start of the fight. All you want to do is just get your conqueror stacks rolling and it's your second rotation of spells with all that extra AP, with the extra healing that's really going to hurt. Now it's always a good idea to come from the flank when you're playing dragon sequences as Silas and your main goal in any team fight really is just to take an AoE ability, AoE CC, AoE damage, AoE shield, AoE heal, whatever whatever you get. Uh, in this case I took Quail, I blast coned him into his team, I'm not afraid to die. This is really important, your job on Silas, you're tanky, you're a frontline champ, you want to keep the fight going. You want to make the opponents use cooldowns on you by as much time as possible and don't be afraid to die, it's okay to die on Silas as long as your teammates clean up the fight. In order to choose the right ultimates in team fights, you need to think about three things. Two of them are fairly obvious, but one most people don't think about. Number one, you need to decide, okay, which ultimate has the best AP ratio. If you go to the wiki, if you just Google uh, League of Legends Hecarim, you can open it up and you can scroll down to his ultimate, it will show you his AP ratio. So in this game, there's two ults like that. There's Jack's ult with a nice AP ratio, uh, and there's Hecarim ult with a 100% AP ratio. Now, number two, you want an ultimate that actually gives you AoE CC or AoE damage. Now, both of these ults give you that. The Hecarim ult is obviously a little bit better because it gives you CC and damage. Now, the deciding factor, the third thing that nobody talks about when it comes to Silas is how does my ult interact with my E, right? Because if you, for example, have Malzaha ult, that ult is really good because it makes somebody stand still, right? You can kind of use it as an engage, but it also locks you out of using any other abilities. Whereas an ult like Hecarim ult ticks all the other boxes, but it actually helps you land your E2. So the value of an ult goes up exponentially if it actually helps you guarantee your E2, because by the time team fights roll around, whether you're playing QE max or you're playing WE max, you've already got five points 
in your E, right? By level 13, you've already maxed out your E. And uh, the only thing that matters in these fights is how easily can you land your E2. And if you miss your E2, it's generally uh, a lost team fight here. In this case, again, if I just took Jack Salt there, uh, because it has good numbers and it does the same AP ratio, AOE damage as Hecromult, I would have actually lost because Soraka would have arrived faster. I wouldn't have been able to land my E2 onto, uh, onto the Jin and one-shot him. And uh, it would have been a completely different fight. So think very carefully about which ult you want to take and whether it actually fits all three criteria that you're looking for. Now, another thing you should think about is your role when doing Baron. Most of the time, you're going to be the man responsible for marking the enemy jungler. Your abilities don't really do that much damage to Baron, so you need to be tracking which way the enemy jungler is coming from. And as soon as they get close, stamping your teammates ping your intention that you're about to engage, just go over the wall and engage them. Do not let the Baron be a 50-50. Hold this bush, right? Hold this bush, or if the enemy is walking through the red buff bush, then go and camp the red buff bush. Doesn't matter where it is, somewhere around Baron. These are your bushes, these are your responsibility on Silas to keep the enemy jungler away or to start a fight uh, to avoid flipping a Baron. Now, once again, when you're setting up Baron, it's important to think about the different positions you could take. Uh, the main bush, like we always say with grubs, is this one. Uh, you can uh, engage on the opponents that are walking here from the mid line bush. If you think that you might get wrapped from two sides here, they might enter through here and through mid as well, then the mid line bush is not safe. You could hold behind this barren wall and E over and engage there. You could also hold here. If you know the opponents are walking through mid and they're not clearing any of this sort of jungle, you can either hold in this bush or you can hold somewhere around uh, the blue buff wall, dash over and catch them by surprise. Uh, if you were standing in the bush, uh, that's the most dangerous place to be in, so you want to avoid actually standing in the bush, just like with the great, uh, the, the red trinkets, you know, people just throw up blind abilities in the bush because they know that you might be there, so you want to let them throw their engaged spells first and then come from the side and uh, easily clean up. It is finally time to look at the Silas tier list. Now the top two rows is where we're going to be spending most of our time today because these matchups have some specifics that you should know about before loading into the Rift. Uh, the bottom three skill brackets are very, very easy to decide for yourself about how you should itemize, how you should play it, what runes you should take. Just refer back to the tree chart we had at the start of this video where if you're versing a uh, ranged bully champion like Vex, for example, you're going to go Electrocute, Second Wind, and Max Q, then E. Whereas if you're versing someone like Zillion, uh, you know, an easy range matchup, I'm just going to max WE, take Electrocute, uh, and go uh, Mana Flow Band plus Transcendence, right, to get push, uh, to stay active, and, and snowball the game even outside of my lane. Now for the hard matchups, specifically, we'll, we'll start from the left-hand side. Uh, Aurora, I think this matchup could even be a dodge on site. The lane is completely unplayable. Uh, it's very difficult because you can never land your E2 on Aurora. You can never land your Q2 on Aurora because she has move speed from a passive. She has an E reposition and she has a dash on her W into a stealth. And that just basically makes the matchup completely uninteractive. If you try to trade Aurora, you will always lose. You have to max WE in this matchup because your Q is not effective. And if you max WE in this matchup, you still need to take second wind. And you cannot really stick on Aurora, especially outside of lane. You will never be able to maintain Conqueror stacks. So you have to take Electrocute. So this is a uh, anomaly. You know, this, this does not fit anywhere on our tree chart. But in this specific matchup against Aurora, you have to take Electrocute, second wind, and max WE because that's the only way to play it. The good news is that you're going to get one of the best ults in the game to steal. So if you manage to survive, survive the lane, survive the, the mid game and get to team fights, you're going to absolutely uh, be a more useful Aurora there. But uh, what I find is that when I play against Aurora, I go down 20, 30, 40 CS. Uh, you know, my bot lane gets ganked by the Aurora, they die, everybody's tilted, everybody FF. So this is a very difficult matchup to play. Uh, in the same respect, LeBlanc is another anomaly to our tree chart. This is another matchup where you have to max WE, you have to take second wind, you have to go electrocute because you can never land your Q2. She has a stealth and four dashes. It is just not possible to land that second pop of your Q. Uh, so another difficult matchup where you kind of have to uh, endure lane, be happy with being down 10, 20 CS, and just uh, uh, get to team fights and do your best work there. Uh, Lucian, again, same matchup as uh, Aurora LeBlanc in the sense that you cannot land your Q2 on Lucian because he will always dash it. So this is another matchup where you have to max WE, take second win to survive lane, take Electrocute to help you with trading. You will go Oom. Um, you will not be able to clear waves properly. Uh, you'll be very, very starved on mana, but at the very least, if you get ahead, uh, you can snowball and win the game because you have uh, the correct rune choices. Tristana is also a hard matchup, uh, the exact same reasons as Lucian. Tristana can dodge your Q2 with her W, she can dodge 
uh, your E2 or buffer it with her ultimate as well. She can also buffer your chains with her W if she's good. The thing is right now, Tristan is very, very weak. So I would put this in the easy matchup tier because of how bad the champion is. But in a couple of days, Freak said that they're giving Tristana some big buffs. So I'm going to keep it here in case you're watching this video down the line. Uh, Tristana is a hard matchup. You have to max WE, take Electrocute, uh, not push the wave, just catch the wave second. And hopefully some skirmishes will come around where your mobility is going to give you the edge. Uh, Yasuo and Yon, uh, both of these champions are completely unplayable for Silas. These champs will skill check you at every stage of the game. They are stronger than you in lane. They are stronger than you uh, in terms of sustain with fleet. Uh, the only advantage that you have in these two matchups is the power spike. When you finish your first item at 2600, you get your rocket bill at 2600. And for that amount of money, they only have like Vamp Scepter, Dagger, and Zerkas completed. So it's important to understand the power levels for Yasuo Yon. When they get their Zerkas, you shouldn't fight them because that's their power spike. But then when you complete your full item, you should fight them actively. You should try and roam. You should try and use your prior to do something on the map and get ahead. If you get ahead, then these matchups can be quite easy because they don't build any magic resist, right? First item, even second item, usually Yasuo Yon will build any magic resist. Uh, so they're very, very squishy. If you get ahead, you can snowball these lanes, but it's just so difficult to do that. They're just so safe. Uh, with Doran's shield, second win, there's nothing you can do uh, with fleet footwork to force them out of lane. They will just go even. They will kind of go even in prior as well. And uh, once they get Bork, you can never ever side lane against Yasuo Yon. Do not ever try fighting a Yasuo Yon on a side lane that has Bork Zerkers. You cannot win. Like, it's just not possible. There's too many ways for them to dodge your abilities with uh, Wind Wall, you know, buffer your E2 with Yon ult, for example. If Yon just cast ult as you're casting E2, he will buffer your stun and he guarantees landing his ult. And then you come out of the E2 and you're actually stunned for longer than Yon is. So both of these matchups are just very difficult for Silas. I mean, you have to play Conqueror, uh, WE. Uh, second wind and just hope for the best hope that uh, uh you can make enough impact happen when you're stronger than them uh before they actually completely take over and start to become side lane gods now rise is a fairly difficult matchup because in lane you can never dash on him or he will root you in his wave he can also stat check you if you are tanking his wave he can't really force on you outside of your wave right he can't really walk past the wave and uh and chad you zone you off the minions so it's kind of like you will get your items but rise will also get his items it costs way less mana for him to kill the wave uh, than it does for you so you pretty much have to max qe against rise and go electrocute so that you can match his push and match his roams the problem with that is if you max qe and then you find yourself on a side lane against rise that has rod of ages archangels and merc treads uh, the QE electric build requires you to one-shot someone. Unfortunately, you cannot one-shot this champion. So you would actually rather have Conqueror WE max against Ryze. Uh, but if you do that, you're going to suffer in lane, but you're going to have a better time side laning later on. So it's totally up to you which style you want to play. Think about the enemy team comp, whether they have uh, a few uh, melee champions, whether other people are going to be uh, opting into magic resist. But yeah, I think the biggest issue with Ryze is that he doesn't really give you roam windows because he pushes the wave too fast and you can never ever have kill pressure on him. Akshan is a difficult lane, same reason as Lucian Tristana, but I would actually say that Akshan is a little bit easier. Uh, it's harder in the sense that he can run Ignite and the Grievous Wounds is annoying, but it's easier in the sense that he can never ever dodge your Q2. If you play correctly, you will always be able to Q2 chain him, uh, combo that, so it's very obvious that you should just max Electrocute, QE, Second Wind against Akshan, play that one-shot playstyle, and uh, the later the game goes, the less useful he becomes. You know, once you get your two, three items, you get a Zonyas, you'll be able to half HP him, uh, make space in team fights, then pull out your Zonyas, uh, come out for a second combo, and finish him off. So I think this lane is just a lot harder early on, but uh, if your jungle ever ganks, if you get ahead, if you can find windows to harass him when he's trying to ego you under tower, for example, uh, you can definitely get away with playing Silas into Akshan and winning. Karma, I think this matchup is just so annoying. It is completely non-interactive. You can never ever dash on Karma. This champion uh, has way too much healing, way too much shielding. Uh, so you pretty much just have to stand afar, stand from afar and, and last hit the wave with Q and E. Uh, you can play Q max with Electrocute if the rest of her team is squishy. You can also play W E max with Conqueror if you're playing the more team fight oriented style. Both styles are okay. The biggest issue is again, Karma will have infinite roams on you, uh, infinite moves, infinite turns during the laning phase because you just can't kill the wave as fast as she does and you can't kill her to stop her from killing the wave so it's kind of the same problem as rise i would say rise is just a better champion than karma mid right now so uh, at least you know that you will outscale karma uh, when comes the late game because you'll be more useful you'll have some good alts where she's just going to be a shielding and little q mantra q poke bot 
Uh, so yeah, I think this matchup is more frustrating than it actually is. It's it's not very fun to play. Now Heimerdinger is another outlier like LeBlanc and Aurora and Lucian and Tristana where it is a bully ranged matchup, but you cannot max Q because it's too hard to land your Q2 on Heimer. He gets an insane amount of move speed when being around his turrets. And you also can never use your E2 to help you land your Q2 because the guy stands behind a turret or he summons a turret as you dash forward. So it's just really difficult to land your chain on Heimer, which means that you have to land, you have to skill uh, W first, then E, right? You have to max W, then E. You have to do the electrocute build because Conqueror is kind of useless. I mean, you could go the Conqueror page against Heimer, but um, I would rather just go electrocute because you're not getting prior anyway. Uh, it, it loses prior in the same way that uh, Silas does against Karma and Rise, but it's also uh, very difficult to kill, not because he builds tank, but because you just can't land your abilities. Now, Pantheon is a really difficult matchup. Uh, he can basically skill check you at every point in the lane. His E dodges way too much damage from your spells because all of your spells are hella telegraphed. And uh, he just is very oppressive to play against. You have to buy cloth armor, uh, first item, first base against Pantheon in order to just survive, in order just to be able to trade. You need to buy cloth armor refill, uh, which delays your item spike, right? The whole point of Picket Silas is that you get this 2600 item spike. You get really strong really early on, and you can start running away with the game. Not against Pantheon. You need to go, you know, uh, Protobelt, then maybe Zonyas, or Protobelt, then uh rift maker instead of going your lich bane like you just need to build tanky so that you can actually survive trades against him you can actually get your farm and uh of course once you get into team fights you're going to be more useful hopefully there's a there's a better role for you to take because pantheon ult is kind of useless it never really lands the damage because it's so slow so the dodge on site matchup there's only one guys it's cassiopeia do not ever play this matchup it is unplayable because the problem is the tree chart tells you to max q into e against cassiopeia right um, with Electrocute second one makes sense. She's going to harass you early. She's a bully. If you max QE, this champion builds literally only tank items. She builds Rylai's, which makes you a tank. She builds Archangels, which makes you a tank. She builds Rod of Ages, which makes you a tank. You, you cannot kill Cass. It's impossible to kill her in one rotation or even two rotations. Now, the biggest issue is you might think, okay, I will max... The now you might think, I'll max WE then. No problem. We'll do the same solution as we did for LeBlanc and Aurora and Lucian and Tristana wrong because when you're standing on miasma you literally cannot cast your w you can't cast your w it's not possible it does not let you cast the ability because your w is considered a dash you can't cast your e in miasma because it is considered a dash so your q animation makes you face forward so you get altered by cassiopeia your w animation makes you face forward so you get altered by cassiopeia your e2 makes you face forward so you get altered by cassiopeia it's just it's not possible to play this matchup at every stage of the game at every level there is no point in the game where you are stronger than cassiopeia even if you rush rocket belt if cassiopeia goes tier into rylize she literally gets rylize at the same time you get rocket belt and she's stronger than you so th there's there's no there's the, there's no there's no light at the end of the tunnel in this matchup unlike yasuo yon where at least you have you have some points of the game where you're stronger this champion just beats you 1v1 she beats you on side lane she's more useful than you in team fights she dominates you in lane the only time you can ever win trades against cassio is level one <laughs> level one before she gets her q you can win trades if you start your e and you dash into her you can win some trades uh, but yeah, I mean, this matchup, if you do end up finding yourself in this matchup, just take Ignite, literally take Ignite, and just try to flip the game level 1. Just flip the game level 1, try to trade her, and try to kill her level 2. If you can't kill her level 2, just FF. It's it's not playable at all. So, if you've made it to this part of the video, then I can confidently say you've learned everything there is to know about playing Silas. So, start queuing up some solo queue, making some gains, you have my blessing. If you have any specific Silas related questions, hop into my Discord, the link is in the description below. Uh, you can also organize private one-on-one -on -one coaching if you want to take your game to the next level. And if you're not subscribed already, please do. This video took a very long time to make and I'm hoping to deliver another one to you guys very, very soon.